Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the LSE for this evening's event, which forms part of our Space for Thought Literary Festival. Over the coming week, uh, LSE faculty and a rather splendid array of speakers, guest speakers, will be exploring around the theme of utopias, the power of dreams and imagination, the importance of idealism, escapism, and nostalgia. Nostalgia isn't what it used to be. And of course, the benefits of looking at the world in different ways. Now, uh, my name is George Gaskell. I'm a special advisor to the director here at the school, and I chair a group of people who put the uh, literary festival together. And it's my pleasure today to welcome Alex Ross as our guest, uh, as our speaker, and as a guest to the Department of Management here. Alex is one of America's leading experts on innovation. Between 2009 and 2013, he served as a senior advisor for innovation to the Secretary of State, Hillary Clinton, a role that earned him a distinguished honor award from the US State Department. He also served Barack, uh, Barack Obama in his 2008 presidential campaign as convener for technology, media, and telecommunications policy. Uh, he is currently a distinguished visiting fellow at Johns Hopkins University and has been a guest lecturer in a number of august institutions, including uh, one up the road, what's it called? Oh, Oxford, yes. <laughs> and he has a new book, uh, the Industries of the Future, which he will be uh, describing briefly over the next 35 minutes, and uh, copies will be available outside after, the, um, after his presentation. Now, uh, the Industries of the Future, I've read this, and this covers a range of the key areas for innovation over the coming years, and uh, Alex, uh, has, has produced this book after visiting 41 countries, uh, looking at the advances in every continent. And in this book, he explains uh, some of the major opportunities for progress and development. Now, before I introduce Alex formally, let me do a little bit of housekeeping. After the lecture, there'll be a time for you, uh, we'll have a Q&A session time for you to uh, uh, engage with Alex on themes of your interest. Uh, can I remind you, as I remind myself, to put your phone on quiet? But for those of you who are into Twitter and would like to join the discussion today, the hashtag is hash LSE lit fest. That's probably up here. No, it isn't. Hash LSE lit fest. And uh, this uh, lecture will be recorded and uh, uh, technical difficulties occasionally occur, but we very much hope there'll be a podcast and a video. So, without further ado, let me introduce uh, Alex. Welcome to the LSE, and we look forward to hearing about the industries of the future. walk and talk if that's okay. Um, thank you, George, for that wonderful introduction. You read it just like my mother wrote it. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, thank you all for coming out on this pretty sunny Lon London evening. Uh, I'm going to speak for 30-ish minutes and then hope we ha can have some robust uh, question and answer. I will say I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I welcome undiplomatic questions. Those tend to be the most interesting. Uh, for some context, what I want to do is I'm, I'm just going to read two different parts of the book at two different, two different junctures. But I want to start framing this discussion of the industries of the future with uh, the first page of the book, starting with the first sentence. It's 3 AM, and I'm mopping up whiskey-smelling puke after a country music concert in Charleston, West Virginia. It's the summer of 1991, just after my freshman year of college. 
While most of my friends from Northwestern University are off doing fancy internships at law firms, congressional offices, and investment banks in New York or Washington, I'm one of six guys on the after-concert janitorial crew at the Charleston Civic Center, which seats 13,000 people. Working the midnight shift is worse than jet lag. You have to decide if you want your work to be at the beginning of your day or at the end of your day. I would wake up at 10 p.m., eat breakfast, work from midnight to 8 a.m., and then go to bed around 3 p.m. The other five guys on the crew were a rough bunch. Good guys, but beaten down. One carried a pint bottle of vodka in his back pocket, which was gone by lunch at 3 a.m. A scraggly redhead from the hollows, the valleys that run between West Virginia's hills, was sort of my, near my age. The others were in their 40s and 50s, at the peak of what should have been their wage-earning potential. The way country music concerts work in West Virginia is people drink way too much. Our job was to clean up the results. The six of us canvassed the arena with enormous jugs of fluorescent blue chemicals, which, when poured on the concrete floor, would just sizzle. The last wave of innovation and globalization produced winners and losers. One group of winners were the investors, entrepreneurs, and high-skilled labor that congregated around fast-growing markets and new inventions. Another class of winners were the more than one billion people who moved from poverty into the middle class in developing countries because their relatively low-cost labor was an advantage once their countries opened up and became part of a global economy. The losers were people who lived in high-cost labor markets like the United States and Europe, whose skills could not keep up with the pace of technological change and globalizing markets. The guys I mopped with on the midnight shift were the losers in large part because the job they could have gotten in a coal mine years before had been replaced by a machine. And whatever job they could have gotten in a factory from the 1940s to the 1980s had moved to Mexico or India. For these men, being a midnight janitor was not just the summer job it was to me. It was one of the only options left. Growing up, I thought that life in West Virginia was representative of life everywhere. You are doing your best to manage a slow descent. But the phenomenon I was witnessing in West Virginia really made sense to me only as I traveled the world and saw other regions rising as West Virginia was falling. And so the reason for my sharing that opening passage is to give you a little bit of framing for this topic of the industries of the future. Growing up, look, I don't have a, an ounce of blue blood in this body. You know, I say I, I grew up with a chip on both shoulders, one from being a midnight janitor in West Virginia, the other from being an inner city school teacher in Baltimore after I graduated from university. And so I thought of, of the global economy as something that was just sort of inevitably steering downward for people like the community that I grew up in and the community that I taught in. But what I learned since is that simultaneous to life getting tough in what, in, in what used to be coal mining towns, what used to be industrial and manufacturing centers, life was getting much better around the rest of the world in developing economies and certainly in those centers of innovation and wealth creation. And so look, I've, I've had a really fortunate life in the 20 years since I had to work as a midnight janitor. And I, after I left working in government, working at Hillary Clinton's elbow for four years, I sort of paused and said, all right, you know, what do I want to do now? Um, and one thing I recognized that I really wanted to do was I wanted to go from a life of talking to a life of listening. And I wanted to go from a life of teaching back to a life of learning. And the question, and what I wanted to listen for, and what I wanted to learn was rooted in the following question. If the last 20 years, if the great story of the last 20 years was about digitization and the rise of the internet, what's next? If the, if the story of the 20 years from 1995 to 2015 was the rise of the internet, 
what's going to be the story of 2015 to 2025? And so, as George shared, I traveled all over the world. Uh, a friend of mine totaled up the travel, and apparently it, is the, it was the equivalent of 25 circumferences of the globe, or two round trips to the moon with a side trip to New Zealand. And I, I, I came up with a handful of theses. And what I want to do is share some of these theses at a very high level with you, and then hope that that can be the, the basis for some discussion. So high level thesis number one. Land was the raw material of the agricultural age. Iron was the raw material of the industrial age. Data is the raw material of the information age. He who owned the land and controlled the land during the agricultural age had the economic power and had the political power. He who owned the factories and controlled access to the natural resources during the industrial age had the economic power and the political power. He or she who owned the data, control the data, and can interpret the data in the information age have the economic power and have the political power. And so in the same way in which land was the basis for hundreds of years of our economy, I think that data is going to be the basis for the next wave of innovation and wealth creation, uh, at least for the, for the next several decades. Uh, we currently, as of right now, February 2016, we live in a world of 16 billion internet connected devices. So if you take all of our mobile phones, all of our laptops, all of the, your iPads, and then sensors, which oftentimes exist in supply chains, those total up to be about 16 billion network devices. Four years from now, which is not that long from now, 2020, four, four years from now, those 16 billion devices are going to be 40 billion devices. 16 billion to, 20, to 40 billion in four years. We are creating literally Pacific Ocean's worth of data. Uh, we, live, we now live in the age of the zettabyte. We've produced about 5.2 zettabytes worth of data. A zettabyte is 10 to the 21st power. And these Pacific Oceans of data that we are crea creating are going to enable for us to draw out information and apply information in ways that I think are going to recreate old industries while creating almost entirely new industries from scratch. And one industry that I'll start with is the rise of the robots. Uh, the robots of the cartoons and movies from the 1970s is going to be the reality of the 2020s. And the reason for this, I believe, is really twofold. One is a mathematical breakthrough in something called modeling belief space. Uh, there, are, there are things that were once very difficult robotic, robot tasks, like grasping. Grasping might seem like a relatively easy thing to program, but it's actually very difficult to model out mathematically and algorithmically. And breakthroughs just in the last two years in modeling belief space have enabled robots to go from what were dominantly two-dimensional devices to increasingly three-dimensional devices. The second big breakthrough that is notable is cloud robotics. So let's think about C3PO for a second. Um, if, C3, if the C-3PO of the movie in the 1970s walked into this lecture hall right now and interrupted us, sort of walked in, walked in and he'd go, oh my, excuse me, <laughs> found an empty seat, technologically that would be an incredibly sophisticated thing for him to do. From the recognition to the cognition to being able to verbalize to the, to the skills to be able to find a, an open seat and take that open seat. That is an enormous amount of hardware and software whirring in that gold gleaming body. In reality, the C-3PO of the 2020s, if he walked in and interrupted this lecture, 
he would, he would be an internet connected device. He would ping the cloud and would be told algorithmically, excuse yourself, excuse yourself in English. We sense a free seat in the back row, three seats over, go take that seat. The implications of this, being able to draw from a data-fueled hive mind, uh, I think is really re relevant when we think about the workforce of the future. What it means is that the C-3PO's, the very sophisticated standalone robots, don't have to be built with hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars worth of incredibly sophisticated hardware and software for them to be able to act autonomously. Rather, they can be relatively dumb, lightweight, inexpensive devices, so long as they are connected to a cloud that is engorged with data and algorithms that can instruct the cloud-enabled C-3PO what to do. What this means from, further from a labor standpoint is when you compare it to human labor, humans and robots have diametrically opposed cost structures. Hum humans are capex, light, opex, and tense, where, robin, where robots are capex, and tense, opex, light. What I mean by that is that if you hire a human, there are not a lot of upfront costs. You know, maybe your employer gets you some business cards, maybe buys you a computer, not a lot of upfront costs. But every two weeks or so, you want to get paid. It's a lot of OPEX. So when you, are, when you are hired, what an employer is committing to is paying you every two weeks, lots of OPEX. A robot is the exact opposite. It's a lot of CapEx up front. You have to buy the robot, but it's very little OPEX. Uh, once, you, once you buy the robot, you can work it 24 hours a day. You don't have to give it a salary. It's not going to get sick. It's not going to unionize. It's just going to work. And so what's happening right now is because of the rise of artificial intelligence, because of the rise of cloud robotics, and because of robots being able to do increasingly three-dimensional work, we're seeing new equilibrium points where it is increasingly worth absorbing the capex of the robot rather than having to pay for the opex of the human labor. And this is really driven home to me by uh, Terry Gu, the owner of a company called Foxconn, uh, which some of you may be familiar with. Raise your hand if you have a Samsung or an Apple device. Okay, Foxconn made that device. So Foxconn is the Taiwanese company that has the Wembley Stadium-sized uh, factories in China where these things are made manually. And what Terry Gu told me, he said, I'm not hiring any more humans. And he has 973,000 employees, by the way. He goes, I have 973,000 employees, but I've decided not to hire any more humans. I'm now just going to buy robots. So Foxconn, which was the very caricature of the model of bringing in low-cost labor from the Chinese interior to the coast, paying them very little money in a factory and having them work under terrible circumstances and build your iPhones for you, Terry Gu, who's the model of that, has decided it's worth buying a $14,000 robot instead of hiring another low-cost Chinese laborer. All of these changes are posing, I think, fascinating implications for labor substitution and, pass, and, and posing <coughs> fascinating uh, scenarios for us in part because instead of robots being able to do work that is merely manual and repetitive, sort of the work of men with big, strong shoulders in ports, factories, and mills, it's going from doing work that is merely manual and repetitive to cognitive and non-routine. So what we're able to increasingly see is because of the rise of intelligence, of artificial intelligence, we're able to see automation do work where there is more thinking and where the kind of labor displacement that's going to take place is not merely blue collar, men with strong shoulders in ports, factories, and mills, but also low-level white collar. I think about my father. Love my father. 
My father, for 45 some odd years, is a, a country lawyer in a tiny little village in West Virginia called Hurricane, West Virginia. And what he did, uh, for all intents and purposes, is he would create the big stall, tall stack of papers that you would sign 40 times over the course of an hour that would take six weeks to prepare when you were either buying or selling a house. The work I believe that my father did for 45 years is going to be gone within the next five to 10 years because even though it's cognitive, mildly cognitive, it's largely repetitive. And therefore, it's sort of square on with the kind of work that can be replaced um, with the rise of artificial intelligence. Another area that I look at uh, in the industries of the future relates to the future of the life sciences. And my thesis here is that the world's last trillion dollar industry was created out of computer code, and the world's next trillion dollar industry is going to be created out of genetic code. And I wanted to do my second and last reading from the book briefly to tell you a story that I think animates this a little bit. Lucas Wortman is the kind of guy you invite to a dinner party to impress your guests. He mixes advice about which Diego Rivera murals to see in Mexico City with accounts of the latest advancements in cancer research now taking place inside the world's most advanced life science labs. Raised 45 minutes outside Chicago, Wortman speaks with Midwestern affability. He's quiet and earnest, with a round face, kind blue eyes, and short brown hair. His Facebook page is filled with photos of him and his dog, Kazoo. He's a low-key guy. Even while wearing his white lab coat, the 38-year-old Wortman is reluctant to tout his own expertise or share his remarkable life story. But Wortman's life story is remarkable. He works on the cutting edge of genomic technology. From his lab at Washington University in St. Louis, the oncologist and medical researcher studies leukemia in mice, creating comprehensive <coughs> genomic models of the disease. Even more remarkable, Wortman has battled acute lymphoblastic leukemia, ALL, and survived three times. It is a cruel coincidence that Wortman's favorite class in medical school was hematology, where he looked at leukemia slides under the microscope. He loved the work, quote, I think I would be a leukemia doctor even if I had no personal experience with it, Wortman says. You could diagnose a patient's cancer just by looking at the blood smear or bone marrow under a, under a microscope. There's something very satisfying about being in this position, being able to diagnose a cancer by directly looking at it rather than just by taking care of patients. Wortman has been at Washington University for most of his career. He completed college, medical school, and his residency at the St. Louis University. Washington University also saved his life against all odds. In children, ALL is treatable, but it is often fatal in adults. Survival rates for a first relapse are slim, and data for double relapses don't even exist. So when Wortman developed ALL for a third time in 2011, when he was 33, no known treatment could save him. His colleagues at Washington University's Genomics Institute knew the odds were against Wortman surviving, but they wanted to do something, anything, to save their colleague. They decided to do something never done before, sequence both the deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and ribonucleic acid, RNA, from, can from Wortman's cancer cells, then sequence the DNA from Wortman's skin sample as well so they could compare the DNA between his healthy cells and leukemia cells. All cancers begin with damaged DNA. The DNA becomes damaged through time or, an in or inherited genetic makeup or environmental factors like cigarette smoke. And as a result, it mutates. With cancer, the mutated DNA and RNA, which generally work together to make proteins, are malfunctioning. They are failing to control the growth of unhealthy cells, creating a tumor, or failing in their role as the body's repair engine and allowing cells to become cancerous. To treat someone like Wortman, 
Scientists wanted to know whether the protein is malfunctioning because the DNA is providing bad genetic programming or if the RNA's role in creating a protein is not working. Sequencing Wortman's healthy genes, cancer genome, and RNA was a way of pinpointing where the breakdown had occurred. To do this, the Washington University team ran Wortman's samples through the university's 26 sequencing machines and a supercomputer. Sequencing machines can be as small as a desktop computer or as big as a jumbo Xerox copying machine from the 1980s that takes up half the mailroom. The lab put all of them to work and they ran day in, day out, zeroing, zeroing in on the invisible contours of one man's genetic makeup. After several weeks, Washington University sequencing machines found the culprit. It turned out that one of Wortman's normal genes was producing large quantities of FLT3, a protein that was ultimately spurring his cancer's growth. <clears throat> Genome sequencing can be a vexing endeavor. Even when sequencing can pinpoint the offending genetic mutation, it's often the case that the medical community does not yet have any drugs or treatments that are capable of targeting the problem, especially if the mutation is rare. But in Wortman's case, there was some good news. The pharmaceutical giant Pfizer had recently released a drug, Sutant, that could inhibit FLT3. Sutant was intended for treating kidney cancer, but because of his sequencing, Wortman would become the first person to use it for ALL. Within two weeks of taking the drug, Wortman was in remission. Soon after, he was in good enough shape to receive a bone marrow transplant to ensure that the cancer would not come back in a mutated form. Three years later, Lucas Wortman's cancer had not yet returned. He's had side effects from his treatment. He has eye problems and gets mouth infections. But as Wortman makes clear, it's a small price to pay for being alive. His recovery, by all estimations, is remarkable, though he's not out of the woods. His doctor characterizes his prognosis as guarded, meaning the eventual outcome is unknown, and his condition will remain closely monitored. That he has lived as long as he has, Wortman says, he owes to intensive genetic sequencing. I don't have any doubt about that at all. In my case, sequencing really saved my life. Lukeman Wart Lucas Wortman's story is rare, but his treatment is just the beginning of the potential of genomics. Lucas Wortman's will story will someday be ordinary, someday soon. These are this is an example of many of the very hopeful stories uh, that I learned during a couple years researching about the commercialization of genomics. And, you know, most books written about the future are either utopian, oh, we're going to grow up to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise, I'm going to live to be 150, or dystopian, sort of curled up into the fetal position and just bedwetting. I'd like to think of myself as, a, as sort of a realistic idealist. And I think that life is much more in the middle. It's neither utopian nor dystopian. But one area that did make me feel particularly optimistic was thinking about the commercialization of genomics. So much so, and in consultations with the scientists that I, I worked with, I think that my children, age 13, 11, and 9, probably will have average life expectancies between three years longer and five years longer than is otherwise projected. Another story that I, wa I want to share about the power of genomics comes from playing racquetball. Um, I'm one of the last people who still plays racquetball. And there's this guy who I thought was just sort of a gym rat, sort of scraggly old guy, crazy gray hair, big old gray beard, um, pretty good racquetball player. He comes to the racquetball court wearing a knee brace on the outside of his sort of 1970s style gray sweatpants, uh, brings his racquetball gear to the court in a dingy old blue Samsonite suitcase. Turns out this guy is the world's most cited living scientist. Who knew? Kind of a big deal. It was his team uh, in the 1980s at Johns Hopkins that figured out how mutations in proteins cause cancer. Kind of a big deal. And he and his team at Johns Hopkins, as well as researchers at Stanford, have developed something called a liquid biopsy, where, long story short, in the same way in which if you go to your annual doctor's checkup now and give a little blood for them to be able to tell you what your cholesterol level is, maybe you've got an STD, um, 
That same test will be able to identify cancerous cells at 1 100th the size of what can be detected in an MRI. What that means as a practical matter is that cancers that we now routinely find in stages three and four will, will be able to find early in stage one while the cancers are significantly more treatable. And so, and so genomics is one area where I came out feeling very optimistic. Now there are always other implications to this genetic technology becoming more pervasive that, you know, I do think we ought to, ought to scrutinize somewhat. So one of the doctors who I was learning about genomics from, I asked him, I said, all right, so what's the downside to all of this? And he said to me, he goes, designer babies. I said, well, what do you mean designer babies? He goes, well, right now, when you go to the doctor, an expectant mother, relatively early in her pregnancy, you can tell the mother, congratulations, it's a girl. Congratulations, it's a boy. It's also typically the case that there will be one genetic test administered during a pregnancy. My wife and I uh, did this for all three of our children, where basically it gauges the probability that the child in utero has Down syndrome. And with that information, parents can make choices. What Dr. Diaz explained to me, he said, while still in the first trimester, right around 10 weeks, in the future, because of, these, because of this genetic technology, what we will soon be able to tell you is, congratulations, it's a boy. He'll probably be between five foot six and five foot eight. He'll have curly brown hair. He'll have a 13% chance of getting Parkinson's. He'll have an 11% chance of being an alcoholic. He'll have an 8% chance of, and on, and on, and on, and on. And with that information, it'll be really interesting to see what choices parents make about what children to bring to term. And what's more, with developments like CRISPR technology and other technologies, what if parents say, ugh, can we fix that? I don't know about a five foot six son, can we make him six foot three? Ah, uh, 11 percent chance of being an alcoholic. Is there something we can do to snip that out? The answer today is no. The answer in the not necessarily too distant future is probably. And so with the advance of all of this science and all of this technology, so too does our scrutiny of it and the need to assert our human values. I was thinking, too, about this in the context of big data. You know, I'm one of these people who I'm not sort of fist shaking at Silicon Valley. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these people who, you know, is writing really angry essays in The Guardian about how we're, you know, you know making ourselves all slaves to these 29-year-olds in Silicon Valley. Um, but I do think it's reasonable to give some scrutiny to what these big data, data technologies can do. And one example that I describe in the book uh, is about an app called the Good To Go app. Now, apparently there's something called mutual consent. With the problem with sexual assault on university campuses in the United States, uh, people are trying to come up with mechanisms where um, a young man and a young woman practice affirmative consent prior to having sex. And somebody had the idea that we should build an app for this. <laughs> we, apparently everything's being appified. So here's how it works. You've got, the, you've got the app and there is actually an extension on the app where you can blow in and it measures your blood alcohol level. And what you, can, what you do is you are registered and you then input, yes, I am practicing affirmative consent. So that there is no question later about whether a sexual assault had taken place. I think that this is very well intentioned. Here's the problem. If you read the terms of service, the app has the right to sell the data. And it doesn't even specify that it's anonymized. So what, it could, what this theoretically could mean is that it could say, oh yes, 
Poppy Wood uh, practiced affirmative consent six times in 2015. She did three times at this pub. Uh, she did this time at this hotel. She did this time, oh my, at work. Uh, she did it this time. She did so at 4.32 p.m., 11.15 p.m., 11.08 p.m., 12.03 a.m. Her blood alcohol level was, you know, records the blood alcohol level for all of that. And that kind of information can be sold. Now, in a world where that kind of data is being captured, and in a world where none of us tend to read the terms of service of such things, I can't but help but think that all of this data contributes to both our promise and our peril. And so what, you know, my own view is that within all of this, what's most important is for there to be some transparency and some understanding about how the technology is used. I'm all for people having the right to develop an app uh, to memorialize acts of affirmative consent. Uh, but what I also think is that it's similarly important for people to understand the terms of use and other such things. Uh, I want my concluding point before we get into, before we get into the Q&A to be about the skills and to be about the skills and attributes that are necessary to compete and succeed in tomorrow's economy. Uh, the last two chapters that I wrote about, I sort of do this tour de monde. I gave e examples of maybe three industries, you know, big data, genomics, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and robotics. The book has, you know, maybe 12 or 13 of these. I gave a very high level overview of a couple of them. But one question that I, I ask and try to answer is, all right, well, within the industries of the future, what would it take? What, what are the attributes that states and societies need to be the headquarters for the industries of the future? We know that there was this area in California 30 miles, 30 miles long, 15 miles wide, called Silicon Valley, that really sort of got it right on, for the last 20 years, building internet-based businesses. For all of these other industries, what are the attributes that states and societies need? And I go into a fair amount of detail, but let me, let me point out what I think is the, is the most important binary. The principal political binary of the 20th century was the conflict between the political left and the political right. What I believe the, the principal political binary of the 21st century is, is closed versus open. And I don't think that any society, unlike the, unlike the 20th century binary of right versus left, I don't think that in this context of open versus closed, there are any perfectly open societies or any perfectly closed societies. The closest to either of those is probably North Korea um, being closed. In the United States right now, I believe that we are having a pitched battle inside the US about whether we are going to be a more open society or whether we are going to be a more closed society. And my thesis is that those societies that are most open, that respect the rights of all minorities, that do the most to systematically advantage uh, women's participation in all levels of the economy, those places that most allow for innovation, imagination, creation to flourish will be those headquarters in the industries of the future. By contrast, uh, those societies that are mo more closed, those that are more authoritarian, those that are more controlling, I think people will flood out of them who do have the skills and abilities uh, to start these companies and they will find more open societies, more open environments to start their companies. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude the sort of lecture portion of, of my remarks and uh, again, <coughs> invite whatever questions you may have of a diplomatic or undiplomatic nature. It could be about the industries of the future or if you want to ask something political like, what do I think of Donald Trump? <laughs> Knock yourself out. Thank you.
you very much, Alex. Right, uh, we have some roving mics, uh, so please, if you'd like to ask a question, raise a, your hand and wait until the roving mic turns up, and maybe if you say who you are and where you come from, that would be wonderful. And if I could just put in a plea, which is that Alex is the only person here today who is permitted to give a lecture, uh, so <laughs> very keen to hear the questions. So let's start over here with this gentleman in the front row. We'll take three at a time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Carsten Sorensen, I'm from the host institution at Department of Management. So uh, Don Rumsfeld, he talked about the unknown unknowns and got laughed at. Uh, is it not so that this technology is fairly unknown? I mean, Steve Barmer laughed at the iPhone, thought nobody's ever going to pay 700 pounds or dollars for, for a smartphone. So to what extent do you think what you're saying in the book that I haven't read, but I bought it, it's on my, on my iPad, so um, to what extent do you think uh, that the predictions that we can make now are certain, or to what extent are they just, you know, qualified shots in the dark? Thank you. Right, another question in there, that's three or four rows back. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jason Tates. Um, I just wondered um, whether you think uh, the industries of the future will be more led um, by public investment or by private sector <coughs> investment, particularly reflecting on um, you know, the impact uh, on the internet you know, coming out of the state sector uh, and the growth of the space race over the last few years coming out of the private sector. You know, what do you think is going to be more important in the next generation? Thank you. Another question, four or five rows back. Splendid. Hi, can you, can you tell us <coughs> what you think is going to happen to all those people that are going to be automated out of the system? Got it. Okay, so we've got three questions there. Donald Rumsfeld with Stuff Happens. All right. Private three. and public investment. Yeah. Labor so three questions. So to each of your questions, on the, un on the unknown unknowns, uh, predictions are really difficult, especially about the future. Um, I think there are things that I deliberately left out in the industries of the future because I thought that it was too much of a hypothetical based on a theoretical based on a maybe, like virtual reality, um, which I think very well could be something consequential, macroeconomically consequential, or I think it could just be the next step in gaming. Uh, so the, the areas that I concentrated on were those where I had enough data to lead me to believe that we were on the beginning, at the beginning stages of sort of a hockey stick slope in terms of growth. I am certain that I will be wrong about something in the book. If I'm not wrong about something in the book, then it means I took too, f then it means that I was not intellectually aggressive enough. Um, but I believe it all sufficiently aggressively now that I wouldn't disavow any of it. In three years, I'm sure I'll disavow something. Um, to Jason Tate's question about whether Public or private investment is going to be the driver. Um, overwhelmingly private investment. Um, public investment has proven to be uh, absolutely essential for to build the foundation in a field. You mentioned the space race. Well, the space race was in initially entirely funded publicly. Yes, we know that the internet came out of uh, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Group at, at the Defense Department. But what I'm really seeing is that private capital is what's driving commercialization. Even in genomics, which is an example of, of an area where over 95% of the capital that's been spent to this point is government capital, I think, the, I think that the money that it takes to actually productize it will largely come from private sources. To the third question about people being automated out, this is the billion dollar question. And I wish it were a question being put to the presidential candidates right now in our endless presidential debates in the United States, because it's a lot more important than any of the questions that are actually being asked. Uh, I think that we are, I think we're at a point right now where the, we can project the kind of jobs that are gonna be vulnerable and we can project the kind of people who are most at risk to lose their jobs 
So what I believe we need to do is, is I'm speaking for America right now because it's the system that I know best. I think we need to mimic some of the very intelligent things that have been done in Scandinavia, Germany, and elsewhere to take vulnerable members of the working class and make sure that they are getting skills training early enough in their life that maps to areas of what will inevitably be high growth. You know, we have vocational education. Vocational education in the United States in 2016 is no different than it was in 1956. If that doesn't change, then what that means is that, you know, this, edu this slice of education which serves millions and millions of people will be doing them all a disservice. So I really think that we need to be more aggressive um, looking at the curriculum that people, particularly once they enter their teens, are accessing to make sure that it maps as precisely as possible to um, areas of job growth. For people who are later in life and who are unwilling or unable to adapt, um, you know, look, humans are less easy to update than software. And what I believe is that in an environment where billions or trillions of dollars of new wealth are being created, part of what we have to do is take that billions and trillions of dollars of new wealth and make sure that we have a higher and tighter safety net. So I do think that in a world that has simultaneously more bounty but more spread, meaning more products and services that are letting us live longer, happier, healthier lives, but the wealth that is created from that is increasingly spread, you know, from a, with, with a very small number of people being the principal beneficiaries of it, I do think that there's a corresponding obligation for them to basically pay for uh, those millions of people who are being displaced and who can't adapt. Okay, let's take some questions from the left wing. Yes, that was fine. Hi, uh, my name is Hey Magrawal, and I'm an investor in the stock market. Uh, you made two comments about the future. One was in terms of a politically closed and an open society, and the other was that a very high amount of research and development will uh, govern the next uh, development. So would that mean, sir, that maybe the pendulum will swing back from the emerging economies back to the developed economies, because in emerging economies, you know, countries from where I come from, we are quite closed economies and neither can we spend so much money on research and development. Thank you. Um, Two-part question. With the safety net you talk about, with the best world in the world, there hasn't really been an appetite for that in the likes of America, UK to a lesser degree, um, up until now. So what gives you the impression there is like to be any kind of a safety net occurring um, going forward. And secondly, the scrutiny you, you, you discussed, which we all hear about self-regulation and certain um, industries, it, who are these modern industries, who get together particularly when there's political pressure or they need to be seen to be doing something. So do you see more self-regulation or do you see at some point governments stepping in and dictating that um, um, more needs to be done in, in that regard? Could you pass the, uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, my name's Miranda. Um, in addition to industries of the future, I wondered how you saw the industries in the systems of the future. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, a shift from a linear economy to a circular economy, and whether you had any thoughts on that from your research. Thank you very much. Okay. So briefly on these, as to whether Economic well-being will increasingly, fl will, if the pendulum, as you said, will shift from emerging economies to develop, from emerging economies to more developed economies, what I believe is that instead of the last stage of globalization, where we were able to say developing economies will do this, developed economies will do that, Asia will do this, Europe will do that, I think that there's going to be far more fragmentation. And so I, I'm, I would not make sweeping statements 
about, say, developing economies, because if I were to look at the 90 or so countries that I would put in that classification, I would say that there will be 90 different sets of outcomes. And I think that there will be certain of them that do extremely well. And I think that those that do extremely well will be like Indonesia, those that are systematically doing more to open themselves up. Um, and I think that those will founder are those where there is a reassertion of authoritarianism. And so unlike, again, the last 20 years where I think we could index entire parts of the world, uh, either geographically or by, uh, or in binaries like developing developed, I think that we're going to see a much messier 196 country chessboard. Um, and so whether a developing economy does well or does poorly is going to be a function in large measure about whether its systems are authoritarian or open. On the question of the safety net and then about self-regulation, so you're absolutely right that at least in the United States, there's zero political basis right now for the creation of any new safety net programs. We just had Obamacare, and you can see it's practically started a revolution. Uh, but here's the thing. If you're willing to look at this out over a long enough time horizon, I think that the impulse, I think that the impulse on the far right and the far left in the United States is coming from a similar place. I think that people who are supporting, say, Bernie Sanders' campaign on the far left and the fascist candidates, Ted Cruz and Donald Trump, on the far right, they are both coming from places of anxiety. And in both cases, each of those political candidates are pointing at who you should be mad at. So Bernie, in Bernie Sanders with the socialists, they're saying be mad at the 1%, be mad at the bankers. With the fascists, they're saying be mad at the brown people, be mad at the poor people who are on Obamacare. They're both coming from positions of, and I think that they have more in common with each other than they do with the political middle. And I think that it's, I think it is a sense of dislocation, it's a, it's a case of anxiety, and it is a case of unfairness. And I do think that what might look on its surface like the far left and the far right, as the economy continues to develop in the way it is, with more bounty and more spread, more billionaires, and more struggling members of the working class, I do think that there will be more and more momentum for safety net programs like a basic income. This is not something that's going to happen this year. It's not something that's going to happen next year. But it's something that I believe will have momentum over the next five or 10 years. Um, as to your question about self-regulation, I think that industry will continue to self-regulate. Um, especially when it gets political pressure, up to an ending at the point where they demonstrate that they don't have the, where they can't do so responsibly. And the, air, the internet companies, I think, are the best example of those who have gotten away with self-regulation. And I think that they should self-regulate. I don't think that people in Brussels or London or Washington, DC, uh, should be setting strict rules of the road for internet companies. Because bluntly, I think that the internet companies have an understanding of the content, of this content, better than the people in Brussels, London, and Washington. And I say that having run this issue set at the State Department in Washington. So I'm in favor of self-regulation until there's clear evidence of abuse. The area where I think that this is going to be hottest next is in artificial intelligence. Whether artificial intelligence is able to develop laissez-faire or with some kind of government oversight, I think is going to be an open question. What I hope is that it is multi-stakeholder. I hope it involves civil society, academia, business, and government, and that it's not all being driven from one of those four. It shouldn't just be a bunch of academics opining. It shouldn't just be a bunch of government bureaucrats rule setting, and it shouldn't just be businesses doing what they want. It should be civil society, academia, government, and the private sector in a multi-stakeholder model. Um, as to the question of whether my research dr brought me to any conclusions about linear or, or circular economies, you know, I would love to sit here and make up an answer, but the, but the answer is that I don't have any synthesis here. 
and certainly not any original synthesis. Um, you know, I am, I'm still, this is one of those times where I think it's important to remember you've only got one mouth and two ears. Um, and so if I had something original here to say, I would. Apologies. Okay. Lady in the fourth row. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jamina Picht. I'm studying organizational and social psychology here at LSE at the moment. And um, you were talking about the baby that is not even born, and we know so much, so many information about it, oh, about the future life, about the possibilities, the sicknesses and stuff. And so I was wondering, what do you think how people will deal in the future with so many informations, mm. uh, so, so many information? Um, yeah, and maybe from a subjective point of view, um, just, yeah, how do they deal with so many possibilities, so many options, what do they do? Person in the, in the, yes, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, my name is Lydia. Um, I'm quite interested in data privacy, so I was interested in the regulation aspect, but I was also wondering what your position was on the Apple FBI current situation. Thanks. And gentlemen, there. Fine, thank you. Yes, yep. Thank you. Um, I think all of these technologies you've mentioned uh, seem to have huge ethical implications. I mean, the obvious case you've mentioned is the uh, designer baby uh, issue. And taking it one stage further, it, it's possible, I suppose, that you can actually identify all the characteristics you, you wish to have in an offspring. And I wondered um, <coughs> to what extent you think these technologies will develop irrespective of any ethical pressure to prevent them. That's a those are great questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to combine the first and third question and then get to Apple FBI. Um, what, are people, what are people going to do with all of this information? And how does that then connect to a set of ethical questions? Uh, you know, this is one of those times throughout, look, there's nothing new about scientific and technological development bringing forward new ethical questions. The difference now is that we've got more tools to do stuff with all of the information. You know, what I hope, what I sincerely hope is that we not change a single thing as it relates to choices like what child are we going to bring to term. Um, and what I, what I therefore hope is that, uh, you know, parents being able to get this kind of ge genetic information are very, very specific about what it is they ask for. But I also believe they have the right to ask the questions. And I would never impose my views on somebody about, oh, well, you know, 13%, that's still a low percentage, and it doesn't really account for environmental factors. You know, I, I think that, you know, this is a case where information can paralyze you, or it can, or it can, or you can look at it in an almost cold-blooded way. Um, I am really glad that I never had to deal with it with my kids. And, you know, what's interesting, I told you this story of the, the liquid biopsy, where you can detect cancerous cells at 1 100th the size of what can be detected by an MRI. The doctor who pioneered that has never taken a liquid biopsy. Um, and it's because he doesn't want to know. And so I do think that as all of this science and technology develops, there's going to have to be spiritual and ethical developments that go alongside with it that help guide our choices. Um, I don't think, I think that certain countries will make choices for us, you know, especially in authoritarian countries, they will say, you can do this, you can't do this, you can give this information, you can't give that. But since we live in an increasingly global economy, people can always travel to get the information they want. They can always send their genetic sample to another country by mail. And so just, I think, I think it's going to be a different world that we live in. Um, and I'm not sure what all the psychological and sociological implications of it are going to be. Um, on Apple and FBI, I think, um, look, I spent a lot of time in the White House Situation Room <coughs> arguing issues 
precisely like this one and oftentimes arguing it with the FBI. Uh, I think the FBI is making a big mistake here. And I, the reason I think they're making a big mistake is because what they want Apple to do, which is basically hack itself, they want to create a new form of iOS which deliberately has security loopholes which will enable it to backdoor and basically get information. What the, what the folks at the FBI don't seem to want to understand or accept is that by, making tech, by, by creating a backdoor, you're opening the door for everybody. You know, it's not just the FBI who's going to walk through that back door. And in a world where more of our information is going to the cloud, our electronic medical records, our acts of affirmative consent, you know, we actually need more crypto. We need harder crypto. And we should not indulge the control freak instincts of certain parts of government that say they have to have omniscience <clears throat> in real time to all of it. I also think that the FBI here, while it might look like they're making this about a case about the San Bernardino terrorist, I believe that they're litigating this in part to try to create a protocol. What they're trying to do is ensure that all of these technologies are open to them. If this were just about the one phone and the one account, they could work with Apple um, to get at the data. And so I think that, you know, I normally, side, I normally side with law enforcement. In this case, I don't. And interestingly, uh, the NSA, for example, is on the other side of the fence from the FBI on this, where even they're saying, oh, don't undermine crypto. The Chinese will be right in there. Actually, on uh, what's called uh, consumer eugenics is a very interesting uh, discussion in Nature Biotechnology 2015, I think it's May, 25 scientists talking about uh, prospects, risks, benefits, and the ethics. So if you want to uh, chase that up, it's an interesting piece. Right, let's have a few more questions from the middle. Uh, we have somebody in one, two, three, four, five, five rows. And we've got 10 more minutes, so I'll answer the questions quickly. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Armand. I'm an IT project manager, so I deliver a kind of system that you're talking about. Uh, your closing notes were on binary, political binary of open versus closed society. And you also mentioned at the beginning the ownership of data, control of data is how prosperity would be in future. See a bit of a contradiction in there, because by nature, data is something that would become more and more shareable, more public. How can it be owned in future unless it's monopolistic? Therefore, how can capitalism survive in that sense? Uh, this gentleman, splendid. Hello, myself, uh, Prem, doing masters here. Uh, the question is, in 1990s, when the industries were booming, at the end of 1990s, we came to know there's a lot of environmental pollution, so we have to be, uh, we have to be uh, working towards that. So now we clearly know that the futuristic world is more of a data, more of electronic, and more of robot technologies. What is the magnitude of the electronic waste that you project, and what is the alarming issue that countries should be aware in, in forward thinking to keep track of this electronic waste? Uh, let's take it in the front, second row. Thank you. Uh, Shanti Kellerman, um, I'm an alumni. Um, you mentioned skills several times, so I was wondering if you could specifically say a few skills that you think will be useful in the future and that we could teach someone who doesn't have a formal education or, you know, it's not that much. And then secondly, um, you know, we're at a university, a lot of it's academics, book learning. Uh, I had a good time here, I'm not sure my degree was worth the value for the money. So I was wondering if you were going to university today, what would you study to prepare for the future? Wow. All right, I'm going to answer these very briefly. Uh, first, on the question of, I'm not sure I entirely understood the question, but around the political binary of open versus closed and data, I don't see any, I, I, you know, I don't know that I would say a political <laughs> economic system that is open or closed necessarily has any implication on whether data sets are open or closed. 
and as to the future of capitalism, I, so I, I just I apologize. I don't get I don't get your point there. Apologies. Um, let me go to the last question because there are a couple very interesting issues to unpack there. Uh, so on skills, first language learning, foreign languages and computer languages. Foreign languages because the world is gro is growing more global, and to the extent that you can communicate and can communicate and engage, especially in, in parts of the world that are growing fast where not a lot of native English speakers speak the language, you're gonna be extremely well positioned. Computer languages, because basically computer languages, in addition to being a relatively safe source, a, a relatively safe source of obvious employment if you can code at all, it teaches you a way of problem solving um, it's interesting, in all the CEOs that I interviewed for the industries of the future, many of them kept coming back to the point that it doesn't matter if the computer language you learn is eventually going to be overtaken. It's a way of thinking, and it's a way of thinking that will serve you well in the future workforce. What, what would I study if I were at university today? It would be interdisciplinary. It would be a total mashup. It would be like political science with computer science. It would be like electrical engineering with medieval history. It would be behavioral psychology. So I think that tomorrow's great leaders are going to be those that combine something scientific and technological with something from the humanities. I'll just give one example where I think this bears out Facebook. So everybody thinks of Facebook as, you know, oh, created by Mark Zuckerberg, this great computer scientist from Harvard. Yeah, he was great at computer science, but the reason why I think Facebook really became what Facebook is is because Mark is similarly as brilliant at behavioral psychology. And so I actually think of Facebook not being a product of computers, is being a product of computer science, but it being a product of computer science blended with behavioral psychology. So what I would do is I would try to de-silo your education, take something scientific and technological and mash it up with something from the classics. I think we've got time for one more round of questions. We have indeed. Uh, we've got a question in the fourth row. <coughs> <clears throat> uh, Mike Mosley, I, your point about open societies is really, I think, so, so spot on. How do you think uh, we, Britain will fare inside or outside of Europe? Will that be, lead to a more open or a less open society? We can't escape Brexit. <laughs> Gentleman over there in the white. Uh, hi there, this is a question about uh, innovation and inequality in the relationship between the two. So do you think that the proliferation of the industries you describe in your book uh, will on balance lead to more or less inequality in society? Thank you. And yes, please. Thank you. The final question, thank you very much. Hi, I'm... Um um, my name's Fanula O'Connor. I'm an entrepreneur in an industry. Could I you just speak up a fraction? Yeah, sure. Um, my name's Fanula O'Connor. No, but speak into the microphone as well. Uh, kind of helpful. Like that? Okay, great. Sorry, I can't work technology. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm an entrepreneur um, in what I hope is an industry of the future, and my question is about societal changes, because if we look back in the past, every new um, you know, change in industry, whether it's to farming, whether it's to the Industrial Revolution, has come with big societal changes. What are those going to be this time? Wow. Great questions. Great questions. So first, on open societies and the role of the UK in that, I think, look, I can't help but think that if the UK exits the Europe, it is walling itself off a little bit more from the world. Because, and what I anticipate is that you'll then see Scotland reassert, you know, reassert itself once again for independence. So what I actually see is, you know, it's it, the, the UK growing smaller and growing more closed and trying to go back to this ideal of what it used to be as, a part, as opposed to a part of a global fabric and a global economy. Um, so I think that what is playing out here is very much about the struggle between being open and being closed. 
uh, do I think that the innovations described here are going to create more or less inequality? I think they are going to create more inequality, but more well-being. Let me explain what I mean by that. When I was growing up, only rich kids had color TVs, okay? Today, if you go into the poor neighborhoods and go into the house of a poor person, there's probably a color flat screen TV on the wall. Their, their economic standing may have remained relatively constant, but they have more bounty. They've gone from having, over the course of 35 years, a black and white TV to a color flat screen TV with 200 channels. So this is one of the paradoxes of innovation and why GDP oftentimes is not a very good measure of well-being. So I think that within the innovations that are described here, I think that there is going to be more well-being. We're going to have access to more information, more entertainment, more and better food with higher nutrition, better pharmaceuticals and other such things. But simultaneous to this, I think there is going to be more inequality. We're going to see more billionaires and centimillionaires and more people struggling on the bottom end. On the society changes, what a great question. Um, let me say, let me pull one thing out from the book, which is that I think everybody's going to have a scandal. Um, and let me explain what I mean by that. In a world grown with so much more transparency, in a world where we're going from 16 billion internet connected devices to 40 billion internet connected devices, a lot of those devices are sensors. They're going to track where we are. They're going to know what we're eating. That are going to know who we're with. That are going to take video of us wherever we are. And so what I think that this means is that more of what we do is going to be up for public view. Privacy as we know it uh, is going to become scarcer and scarcer. I'm glad there wasn't Facebook when I was in university. I had a lot of fun. <laughs> And I'm glad there wasn't anything to memorialize a lot of that fun digitally. But the very simple fact of the matter is that now there is. And you know, you cannot, hu human behavior is much more difficult to hide today than it once was. And I think the big societal change is that we will come to accept human fallibility to a degree to which we haven't in the past. And I've seen some of these changes in an interesting way. Not that it's fallibility, but let's think, about, let's think about drug use in the presidency. So in 1992, when Bill Clinton ran for president, it was a big deal. Did he smoke marijuana? Did he inhale? Fast forward 16 years, Barack Obama's like, oh, I inhaled. <laughs> I inhaled a lot. And I snorted Coke, too. What shifted over 16 years? Norms shifted. Similarly, let's think about homosexuality. When I was in university, which was not that long ago, homosexuality was still viewed as this very strange thing. Hey, that's the gay guy. Now we all understand and accept that a fairly significant percentage of everybody is gay. Why have we gone from, hey, there's the gay guy, to, yeah, no shit, what does it mean? Norms shifted. So similarly, as, all, as there's this hyper-transparency coming from a world not so much of surveillance, but of surveillance, of everybody having a mobile phone, of everybody living digital fingerprints. I think that human fallibility and all of what that means is going to become the norm. It's going to become more accepted. And uh, we're all going to live with it. With that, let me thank you all. I'll be out. I will be back there yeah, signing yeah. books. I, OK, I good. <laughs> so if you want a copy of you want to buy a copy of the book it is available outside and if you want to buy it and have it signed Alec will be there to sign it for you thank you very much for coming for joining one of the first uh, events of our literary festival if you haven't the program they are available outside and I hope you'll uh, come to some more events and finally Alec thank you so much thank you, thank you.